how do leaders create and sustain change? And what style of leadership is needed to motivate people to undertake change? And the reality is that most of us know that wherever we are in the world, our healthcare systems are in need of leadership. Nursing is in need of leadership um, to bring about the best outcomes we can for our patients, to bring about opportunities to bring the very best of our staff and our colleagues, as well as important things we can do to improve health in our communities as well. So this is a very important thing. This isn't isn't just uh, uh, a US issue. We believe it's a global issue. And I think uh, Marilyn knows that. And that's why we're, we're here today. Next slide, please. Um, look, there are many, many types of uh, leadership. Uh, many of you are familiar with this, I, I feel sure. Uh, part of that is the so-called transactional, the top-down leadership. Um, and I might jokingly say that was pretty much what I grew up with. Um, the nursing sister in, in charge of the British wards I was on, uh, was absolutely in charge of everything. In fact, um, some of you maybe are smiling, uh, perhaps with the similar experiences, perhaps where the ward sister or charge nurse really managed everything. Everything we did was 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 basically top down, and uh, it leads to a couple of things. Clearly, it's an easy way to for communication to work, but as you'll hear later on, there are a lot of challenges with top down type of leadership, and in fact really what we need to be moving towards to is a transactional leadership model. And I want to tell you a little bit more about what that means. Sam? We really talk about two forms of transactional leadership. Uh, contingent reward, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, which is all about positively re reinforcing appropriate behaviors and at the same time, um, those are uh, behaviors or actions that are inappropriate are somehow negatively uh, managed. In many ways, this is a highly ineffective way of managing people. And in fact, uh, I think the literature is beginning to show that such approaches are one of the biggest problems the, the world face, faces in terms of nursing burnout uh, challenges with nurses staying in their positions. And really, we have found that there's little suggestion that it, it improves patient outcomes. Similarly, management by exception, where we monitor groups and correct mistakes. And um, the laissez-faire, if you're familiar with that one of management by exception, where basically people are left alone until there are problems. Well, that's a very dangerous way to be doing anything in healthcare, as we all know that uh, the science and practice of nursing is evolving so fast. We really need to be able to build systems that we can uh, talk through. Uh, next slide. Um, can I interrupt one second? We can maybe uh, problem solve one second. I see a chat that says some of us can't hear anything. Um, I not sure that's something that we can fix on our end because the majority can hear. I guess as speakers, we can make sure our volume is up. Mine is all the way. Um, we can hear. I mean, I can hear, so I'm sure majority of us could hear. So probably the person you should okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, they uh, they've, they've they have they've they've unmuted their their sets. Probably they can equally have a look at that whether they've unmuted themselves. Thank you. And uh, um, and for those who may be having uh, difficulties, of course, we have the slides here, and I think that Laura will be sharing those um, uh, anyway. And the the other issues uh, downsides of transactional leadership uh, are the following: uh, the low expectations of performance. Uh, part of one of the things that we have to think about in healthcare is how we bring the very best out of the resources that we have at our disposal, whether it's financial, whether it's uh, human personnel. And I think one of the, the challenges with um, transactional leadership is that often these approaches simply do not achieve that goal. 
there's often a low level of satisfaction. And as you can you can uh, see there, that the focus is also tends to be on short term issues. If there's a problem, uh, then we try and fix it. But it only deals on those things now. There's less of a culture building approach to improvement for other problems in the future. And as the last point says, uh, the, one of the downsides of transactional leadership is it's very temporary. It solves one problem, one problem at a time. It doesn't build the sort of culture that we really need to bring about long standing and permanent change to our organizations. Uh, next slide. And uh, there's a lot of things about historical outcomes of transactional healthcare leadership. And I just want to go through some of these points with you now. Um, and I'm going to come back to these in just a moment. So I hope you're familiar with the word of, uh, word of silo, that is groups of people who talk amongst themselves, but may not talk or interact with other professions, that, whether it be physicians, pharmacists, or other, other groups. Um, there is generally poor group communication. And when this happens, we all know, and the literature is very clear on this, that there is a higher risk to patients from their safety. We're not sharing the sort of information that we need to share for better outcomes. We also know, and it's actually a piece of research that uh, I'm working on at the moment, is that it leads to one of the biggest global challenges we have, and that is dissatisfaction of nursing care from nurses. And that is they are burnt out. They have um, uh, become dissatisfied with their work. And what they ultimately do is leave their work, leave their jobs as nursing, uh, or perhaps uh, choose to change countries or try other things to improve uh, their quality of care, but also their own personal lifestyles, perhaps. We know about poor um, uh, patient outcomes. Patients often don't uh, have any input. Uh, also, we know there's increased concern for liability, uh, risk of legal action against institutions, and quality improvement tends to suffer. And the bigger thing, and I think this is something which is central to all we're talking about today, is that there is a lack of strategic planning. That is planning from beyond today to try and imagine where an institution wants to be in one, two, five, and 10 years. This all begins with the type of leadership that's envisaged, the type of leadership that you're able to develop, and why this particular um, notion of, of um, leadership is very, very important going forward. Next slide, Sam. So what is transformational leadership? Uh, and I think we've uh, reduced these to uh, a few small numbered of elements, the ability to get people to want to change, and just as important to be able to lead change. And the key elements of leadership and um, not knowing exactly who our audience is, I imagine some of you will be leaders already. Some of you who are leaders perhaps are looking to have greater impact on your organizations. Uh, some of you maybe aspire to be leaders uh, who want to bring about change, who want to think about how they can work with the hospital, with the leadership to improve patient care, whether it be in hospital or in your communities. But there are three things that I think are central to all of this. The first of those is that folks, uh, leaders, potential leaders, future leaders, need to have inspiration and charisma. And what I mean by inspiration is, I think we all have to have a vision of where we want to go. We have to picture what we need to do to improve things and find ways to motivate others. And some of that with by charm, charisma, and as we'll see on in a moment, data. And I think the data part comes into the second bullet here, which is intellectual stimulation. Transformational leadership is hard work. You have to be able to convince your colleagues about changes in what you want to do. That is going to be driven very much by data. The intellectual stimulation of finding new ways of doing things and communicating those to others in a way that makes sense, in a way that is timely, 
and yes, in the early days, ways that are practical, things that you can do reasonably within the resources. That doesn't mean to say you don't have big ambitions for three to five years down the road, but we have to begin this idea of thinking. And then, of course, transformational leadership is an individual thing. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, leaders uh, who wish to be transformational leaders uh, understand the importance of that as a way forward. In many ways, transactional information, transactional leadership are easier and quicker, perhaps, to get things done. But as individuals who will become transformational leaders, you will realize just how important it is to adopt approaches that will have long lasting changes to your organization and long lasting ways in which to improve care for others. At this point, Laura, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that? Oh, I think you're on mute. I, I would say that um, I, I have the benefit of, uh, can, uh, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh is a transformational leader and so having that type of model within an organization uh, the assumption is that in western countries we have um, pretty much solved all these problems and we absolutely have not um, the fee-based capitalistic system of healthcare in our country is in many ways um, a significant challenge to the types of transformational changes we need in healthcare and so we have some deep admirations about some of the things that are happening in your country that we'll look at in a minute. But it helps to look for role models in your profession, within your institution. And certainly the other thing is to encourage everybody to become transformational at no matter what level they are in the organization, whether it be transforming just their personal work and responsibilities. Um, it's the same talents needed to be transformational in your it, to bloom in in the place that you're planted at the moment and then aspire to growing uh, thank you Laura. Uh, next slide sam please so a little bit more about uh the key cornerstones the pillars of what transformational leadership really is all about so let's talk about inspiration and charisma and the points I'd really like to um, introduce you to, or perhaps reinforce if you're familiar with them, is, is the notion of how important the relationship and the bond between leadership and the group of people who you're working with is, just how important this is. And it's all about, in many ways, building trust. And in fact, that's something that uh, is central to everything we do, uh, whether it's patients trusting us to care for them, whether it's our colleagues that we trust to do the best work they can every day to improve the work of our uh, the lives of our patients all those things are, are very important and i think to do this it's important to sustain and develop strong emotional bonds that o overcome some of the psychological resistance yeah. to change and let's be very honest change can be difficult uh, change involves doing things differently. Change involves working perhaps with people who you might not have worked before or in places you haven't worked before. But most important, change is about, in, in terms of transformational leadership, is about how you think about problems, how you think about the relationship between your colleagues and your co-workers and those people who you lead and yes, uh, the relationship between senior hospital management, because we all know that in a large organization such as yours and ours, uh, there are many levels of leadership that we have to navigate. But I think it's very important that as transformational leaders, you're very clear in the direction you want to go and you can inspire others to follow. The second part, of course, is the intellectual stimulation. Uh, bring about change has value in itself i think it's a process whereby we're able to collect data use information to make a good argument for why we would change things we look for new solutions and we find for creative and innovative ways to empower members 
to really perform the very best they can in nursing, but also perhaps to use uh, the resources that you have in different ways or be very creative in the way in using your resources in different ways. That takes courage. And sometimes to build upon courage, you already have to have those strong trust, those strong emotional bonds moving forward. So you, as you can see, transformational leadership is an internal thing to the individual, the leader, some of you on this call now. It's also the relationship, particularly of trust, of how we work with our colleagues and those people who you supervise. But also increasingly, it's about how we use the resources we have. And that's part of the intellectual stimulation finding new ways to solve problems, to use things in different ways, and innovation is central. And the individual considerations um, is that you have to develop strong role models and relationships with those members of your team. And that's important because we have to ensure equity, equity in workload, equity in simple things sometimes, like holiday time, and equity that everybody understands is fair and just. Uh, Sam, next slide, please. And so, and I thank um, uh, Laura for this this slide. Uh, and feel free to interrupt at any point. What uh, what uh, we've done here is to put all these things together for you. So, in one slide, you can begin to see some of the evidence-based impact of organizational change on patient outcomes. And I, I say patient outcomes because wherever we are in the world as nurses, we are always challenged to ensure that our patients are looked after as best as we can. And that with the resources we have, the talent we have at our disposal, we get the best outcomes possible. For some people, Getting people home is, is what's important. For others, we may have people getting back to uh, work and so on. But whatever we do, we work to get the best outcomes for our patients. And as you can see at the top there, there are four circles. Uh, the first is the individual and organizational characteristics that are important for, for transformational leaders and leadership to consider. We have to think about the organizational culture. Are we all pulling in the same direction for improved patient outcome. The individual side, are we all using data and information and resources to the best that we can? And we're all pulling in the same direction. And we all have different life experiences to that, that effect. The leadership behavior <laughs> needs to be inspirational. It has to be uh, talking about the way we would like things to be. That's the idealized behavior and attributes. Where do we want your organization to be? And if you're a unit manager, a unit leader, a charge nurse, or a ward sister, how can you work with your, your nurses and others to really bring about the best? And that's the individual leadership behavior. Uh, then you can see the others. There's the follow and group impacts. That, that under transformational leadership, people become motivated. They want to be uh, part of a team. We look at group collaboration, we work differently together. And on the outcome side, of course, we work towards increased organizational commitment, or at least the goals of your units. We have a, a perhaps a strategic plan or a goal of some form that you want to achieve. We also work to increase commitment, leadership, and vision. And I'd like to add just a few other things that aren't on this slide, but I think there are things to think about when it comes to transformational leadership. And I have these summarized to you shortly. The first, of course, is that leadership improves, transformational leadership will improve staff engagement. To be a transformational leader, you have to talk to your colleagues. You have to listen to what they have to say because many will have great ideas. So you have to find opportunities and ways for them to move forward. And as uh, I think a comment has come through, uh, you have to work with other groups, physicians, pharmacists, and other professional groups, all very, very important. 
It also moves to decision making, which I've talked a little bit about earlier. That will lead to better outcomes for your patients. The decisions that you take are likely to lead to better outcomes for your patients. Mm. We also talk about partnerships, and, and Marilyn's a, a comment in the text was was well well timed, Marilyn, because part of it is a, it is about effective partnerships. We all know that the outcomes of patients as a transformational leader is dependent on others. In other words, on one approach is top down. Transformational leadership is in, in, is involving others in this process, not just those you manage, but convincing others that that changes need to happen. Whether with your physician colleague arrangements, your doctors, your surgeons, there are all ways we can work together. But it takes that transformational thought, those ideas, to even have those discussions in an organized way. That's really important. Also, you heard me mention data, and we could talk a lot more about hospital data. If we use data as knowledge and power, it's very important that transformational leaders uh, have data to make their cases, to make argument. And often it's very important you collect data and use those as evidence uh, to bring about change. And transformational leaders are really good at doing that. The other thing we've talked about is breaking down silos. In other words, transformational leaders have a particular characteristic of ability to span different work groups, physicians, surgeons, pharmacists, to work with them collaboratively again to bring about the very best that you get. And yes, it might bring about some change as well. It also brings about the unity of purpose. Just imagine if you have everybody in either our organization or your organizations all saying the same thing all working together, all collaboratively sharing information. This is a real change, long-term change happens. And that starts with um, transformation. So all those- Steve, can I a comment about this slide uh, quick too? This slide I think is especially important um, as we focus on the organization and not one particular division such as nursing or pharmacists, but physicians, that if this um, recognition and behavior doesn't start at the top and then um, is assumed to be a requirement of leadership through all divisions um, and adds the opportunity for communication between these groups, then that's not transformational leadership. It must start at the top but it also must bubble up in every um, organizational unit within a complex hospital or healthcare system must push up and push forward with a transformational leadership style. So the labels are less than important than the, the behaviors, um, excuse me, than the titles. But the other thing that I would say is one of the, the downsides is being committed to the time that it takes for that leadership and having interprofessional meetings. Um, that is a burden, but it's a critical, important um, opportunity for uh, changing uh, in a transformational way. Uh, uh, Laura, thank you. And that's a point well taken. Um, those of you who are leaders, it's not easy. Uh, it's something that we all have to, to work on very hard. And your point about uh, organizational um, commitment to transformational leadership is, is an important one to consider. Um, next slide, Sam, please. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, how to reduce uh, the impact of silos. And then I'm going to ask Laura to talk about, about the next slide, which is, which is a much bigger picture uh, about um, how uh, leadership fits into a much larger aspect of organizations. So there are many ways, uh, and I'm, we're just picking on, on one here, um, about silos. We could have chosen data, and maybe we can talk about data at another, another time. But this is important. Um, for real transformational leadership, as Laura was saying, uh, it has to span, it has to cross more than just your own individual professional group of nursing. Um, and one of those groups which uh, we work with a lot, and I suspect you do too, is uh, those in medicine and surgery. And so there are three uh, ways in which um, it's considered to help break down some of those 
uh, silos, how we might work together. And the three that we've come up with here, and, and uh, this is from the Journal of Hospital Medicine, is if one can, and these are, and we recognize these are these may or may not be culturally always appropriate um, to folks, and we're, we're sensitive to that, is, is to ha have an opportunity to know each other personally. So we begin to put a face and an understanding of why people make the decisions that they do. Uh, the second part is try and find those areas where we have shared affiliation, shared interest. And I think most people would say improve patient outcomes, uh, or in some cases, it might be uh, ways in which we can free up bed places because uh, throughout the world, hospitals are full. And we may need to find ways, for example, of moving people into other care settings when they're well enough to do so. And that might be a shared affiliation, a shared goal. And then the last one, uh, and I think Marilyn is, uh, has some, is some scheming here at some point, um, is to consider projects across specialities, these interdepartment um, studies, where we might share data, where there might be opportunities to talk and work through common problems uh, that you've worked through through your shared affiliations. So trying to understand the position of um, other groups, physicians, surgeons, pharmacists, trying to find those areas where there is a mutual interest and then to find ways um, to work together. And, you know, um, one of the things we have found is, is data um, and sharing information is a very powerful way to gain both credibility um, and to influence others when it comes to change. And that's very much at the part of transformational leadership. Uh, next slide, please, Sam. Laura, would you like to talk about this yes. one? So um, um, I wanted to just uh, tell a little bit about my background as a family nurse practitioner or what we call an advanced practice registered nurse. Um, in the United States. Uh, some countries in Africa have um, or, um, roles, uh, clin uh, clinical officers. We In this country, we have physician assistants, but these are um, roles that provide increased access to care um, in ambulatory settings, but also as cl clinical nurse specialists, similar to what nurse midwives do within the OBGYN environment. And so I have been a family nurse practitioner for 42 years, and that has allowed me to really uh, spend a lot of time in bridging this relationship between medicine and nursing and finding partnerships to um, recognize each other as colleagues in healthcare and improving outcomes. And there was a particular uh, report called the Institute of Medicine that was initially generated by uh, physician groups, but the uh, National Academy of Sciences looking at this issue of transformation in healthcare. And the report that they came out with focused on what would be the not quickest, but deepest meaningful change um, for healthcare uh, to begin with. And they recognize that because nurses um, are the largest part of the workforce, um, not the most important, that's the point here, but the largest and the closest to direct patient care on many levels, they had a very strong statement about how nursing should change within organizational structures. Historically, uh, administrations did not include a nursing voice. Um, they typically would have a representation from the medical voice, uh, which absolutely is an important part too. You've got to have the administrators who are specialists in how to run uh, organizations, but you need that medical voice of physicians and pharmacists and other healthcare providers, but also nursing. And so one of the things that was developed was this concept of magnet hospitals and magnet organizations. And so our framework was developed to begin transformational healthcare changes with a focus on how to change nursing. And what was recognized 
worldwide impacts could be made if you looked at empowering nursing voice to develop transformational leadership within nursing and to be colleagues working with transformational physicians, transformational hospital organizational administrators, transformational pharmacists, uh, you know, therapists of every level, and that we also recognize that the patient has a voice in this too. So this framework was developed that really developed um, competencies about what is exemplary professional practice. And nurses were expected to demonstrate competencies to show that they were experts in their field all the way down to direct bedside care. And that included data collection around infection control, hand washing, uh, management of human tissues and specimen, uh, specimens, uh, how the lab handled, how uh, environmental services managed. It actually broke down every element of contact to a patient to look at what was exemplary competency for professional practice. And then that asked for what new knowledge, innovation, and improvements do we need to have optimal outcomes, empirical outcomes for improved patient care and safety as our primary goal. And we realized that only came if we empowered structurally nurses to be experts in their fields and to collaborate with experts in the medical fields and every department, pharmacy, laboratory, environmental health to make change within systems. Steve, do you have more comment on that? There we go. Uh, absolutely. And I think this in this one picture, um, it begins to add to what will be the next slide I'd like to talk to you about is how all this comes together. And the notion it has to be a system um, that whilst many change by necessity will begin at the, the ward level, um, one has to think about this notion of institutional change, institutional leadership. And uh, this this particular picture um and uh, thank you, Laura, for, for putting this one in, uh, really pulls together many of the things that we've been speaking about for the last um, half hour or so. Um, and you can see to the left how important transformational leadership is to the process of improving healthcare and optimal outcomes. Also at the bottom, new knowledge, and that basically is looking at data, and ways in which we can improve things for our patients. It also on the right includes practice. And you know, I think it's something that every nurse uh, should understand to be their own personal responsibility, as well as their institutionals, institutions. We must take it up as our personal responsibility to be the best professional practitioner we can, to use the best information that we have, to bring the information that we can to improve patient outcomes in the way we do things. And then this structure empowerment, I've left that one till last, is the way that this all has to be permitted. It has to be allowed within the organization as a whole. And I want to talk in, in my next slide about that. All these things come together to bring about the sort of information and the sort of practices that will bring about lasting change in organizations. So that's about leadership. It's about knowledge and innovation. It's about the best practice that you're able to do, whoever you are, physician, pharmacy, nurse, midwife, and then at the very top, the empowerment throughout the organization to carry out those changes in a way that improves everything for the hospital, for your units, for your patients, and yourselves. So this brings all those things together. And the very outer blue ring is that this is a global issue. This is not a Western issue. It's an issue for all nurses to face as we work in hospitals 
and as we strive to bring about change in our organizations. Uh, that, next slide. Uh, hang on one second. I, I want to make a quick comment about this terminology magnet. Um, this particular uh, designation is a highly sought designation uh, of accreditation uh, in large hospital institutions, even small rural, that there are criteria to get this uh, accreditation as being a magnet hospital, as in the model to aspire to. And so this has become quite a mechanism uh, for change within institutions with every uh, profession having a responsibility. Um, that's very similar. This happens to be the nursing you know, uh, logo for, for magnet that we're showing, but every element, an example of real life, I'll tell you in, in one particular hospital, they recognized that they were having an infection rate in their surgical ICU. And so the nursing and environmental um, studies looked very hard at data about when those infections and what beds and patients it seemed to happen. And they found that there was a high rate of infection in individuals that had chest tubes. And so the nurse manager took a very hard look at what happens in every step of chest tubes. And what was recognized was that there was a high emphasis um, upon hand washing within that ICU, but that it was recognized that when individuals uh, and in this case, it was uh, open heart surgeons uh, moved between patients. They did not always wash hands between patients pulling chest tubes. And this is many years ago, but it was an example about observation and data um, analysis uh, was able to identify a particular uh, group, you know, that um, uh, needed additional education. Um, or behavior change. And it came down, it was only like two surgeons, but those two surgeons had an eye high impact on uh, infection, post-op infection in open heart patients at the point of chest tube removal. So you can see how observation in the ward, on the unit, um, on behaviors of everybody is an important part of this. The other thing that I wanted to say is, um, this is not just a model, uh, as, as Steve said, for, for Western nations. This model applies to even our smallest, most rural uh, communities and improvement. Um, my specialty is in rural and global healthcare. My doctorate work is in that. And I personally live in a small rural community in the United States. I don't even have broadband which is why my internet is poor. So I wanna just say the other component is strong interprofessional training together and uh, cooperation is what I think has made um, achievement of magnet hospitals, all professions coming together as colleagues is what has made this model work. Next. Yep, uh, thank you, Laura. Um, and then I'll speak to this this slide, and then uh, uh, Laura has much to say, I think, about uh, the work in, in Ghana and some of the things that are going on. So uh, the important points to take away from the last slide was that this is an organizational challenge. It's not just a unit challenge. We have to talk amongst other groups. And here are a few points that just exemplify to show what those are. The first being that change has to be well planned and thought through. Um, if we're going to be transformational leaders, we're thinking through how we bring about change and it's actively managed. You involve others. You think about what you need to do and how you can bring about uh, new colleagues to discuss issues, how you can bring about the best resources you have to manage the change. That leads very much into the communication side that change is about continual communication uh, at all points of change, at all points of thinking about doing things, talking about the data, talking about information. And some of these things, you just have to create an opportunity 
to keep talking and discussing things. And that may not always be easy. easy. I know your lives are all very busy as um, uh, nurses, as managers, as leaders, as sisters and charge nurses. Sometimes we have to find the time for that outside of perhaps the normal uh, ward um, change over shift communications. Um, as Laura's last point, uh, and very, very important, the notion of interprofessional training, that is sharing ideas, sharing training across professions, whether it be pharmacy, whether it be dietitians, or physicians, surgeons. Um, if there's the opportunities to learn together, these are very powerful ways in which we can bring about transformation and change. We also have to listen to feedback. Um, some of it, as you may well know as leaders, isn't always positive, but nevertheless, you still have to find ways to listen to the comments you're getting, measure them. And comments that come back may change the way you do things. We always have to keep attention to goals and outcomes. In other words, we can't just set them at the beginning of the year in January and forget about them. They're the sort of things, once you agree, you have to always pay attention to. Um, sometimes you'll achieve them and you can move on to other goals, but you have to have sustained attention. And to do that, you have to involve everyone. And it says worker involvement at all levels. In my own career, and I suspect many of you will have this information as well, there have been some great ideas uh, from folks who are yeah. Or uh, maybe aren't even nurses. I'll, I'll just share something for you. I started cleaning hospital floors before I ever became a nurse. I learned a lot about care of patients, cleanliness from cleaning floors. And I've never forgotten that because everybody can contribute to change and improve. We also have to think about how we work together. That's the work design. We also have to think about what's called a learning environment, um, a learning organization. That is everybody's uh, input is valued and can be used to bring about change. And the skilled transformational manager realizes that, creates ways in which individual responses and thoughts can be heard, but at the same time valued and build confidence. It's the trust part again, coming back to give comments. And then we have to think about learning. Um, whilst uh, I've said earlier that there is a responsibility for all of us to manage our own excellence in practice, you know, uh, in reality, in addition to that, learning processes and expectations have to be managed for all employees. It may be that as a transformation leader, some of your people you're working with may not have the skills they need to be as effective as they could be. These might be clinical. These might be the way in which data is interpreted. So at all times, we have to think about how we as an organization can improve the learning opportunities for all of our employees. And then, of course, uh, we look to improve always individual leadership decision makings and skill developments. And that is, as in my introduction, and thank you again, Aaron, for a very generous introduction, I still go back to take leadership training. Uh, so leadership is never done. New things emerge, new ideas. And sometimes we, we have an expression, um, uh, you know, have, you have a saw to, to cut through wood. Sometimes we have to resharpen the blade of that saw to make sure your cut is true. And sometimes we have to go back and continue our own learning and skill development to bring the very best from yourselves, but also those who look to you in a trusting relationship to bring about change. That's going to be very important also as you influence others within the health system. Next slide, please. And I, and I think, um, uh, Laura, you have something to say here. Yeah, um, I want to uh, just focus on some of the things as uh, we were preparing for this, this talk. We really want to learn much more about Ghana, and we had learned so much from Marilyn um, and the opportunity that we had to uh, work with her as uh, mentors when she spent um, her summer at UC Davis in California uh, associated with us. We chose her 
uh, as our uh, mentee, we had options uh, of several different individuals. We've mentored physicians in the past with the Mandela Washington uh, Award. We've uh, mentored uh, nurses. And I have to say, of all of them, Merlin is really the most active and proactive and transformational right now. So I want to say kudos uh, to Marilyn. It's a joy to work with her uh, since she left us a year ago. But what I did was I wanted to go straight to World Health Organization, which has so much to say about how countries are doing, performing, and meeting um, you know, the metrics around transformational healthcare change. Heaven knows we have the need everywhere. But it's important to focus on regions and Africa as a continent has significant challenges. And it was so exciting to recognize this is the headline from World Health Organization's newsletter. They say Ghana as transformational leader in Africa. That was World Health Organization's uh, leading line on their newsletter. And so I looked at what were things that were going on here that Ghana is doing well um, beyond your, your uh, peers and, and colleagues within healthcare in, in Africa. And uh, you've launched the Health Transformation Leadership Program, you know, for strategic planning within your country. Um, you've committed with global partners to improve maternal child health uh, and newborn uh, mortality and morbidity. You tackled um, hesitancy around COVID uh, vaccine to increase your rates. That's a worldwide issue. You're leveraging digital technology in ways that are meaningful to high risk and vulnerable groups, especially adolescents and user and youth who embrace technology, but you have to have it available and leverage it to it being a friendly service. And Ghana has done that. Um, you focused on malaria immunization, which is a highly uh, progressive um, activity worldwide. And um, again, multiple things. Uh, please, please mute. Um, focused interventions on mental health, which worldwide is a major, major issue, and especially coming out of COVID. Um, focusing on strengthening those services. The other thing is um, actually educating the nation around the need and value of blood donors. Um, that is something that just gets missed constantly, but is so critical. And then also um, to encourage adolescents to use data to actually start the next generation of nurturing as healthcare leaders and promoting um, men as nurses and women as physicians, uh, certainly as a part of equity and justice. And the other thing that is really important is focusing on non-communicable diseases through primary health care. And that is actually my particular uh, area of expertise. I had my years in the hospital too, but I've uh, predominantly been in primary care because I think that's a place of long established relationships and where it's important that we make big changes for prevention and keeping people out of hospitals. The other thing that I wanna say is that um, this need of really uh, the interprofessional component is so important that we uh, see this took many professions to make these types of changes already in Ghana. Next. <clears throat> Next slide. So I wanted to make a little uh, photo montage that's related to people who are already demonstrating transformation. Oh, go back to the montage. Yeah. Um, the transformational leaders that you already have in place. And um, I want to start here with Marilyn, um, because it is important not only within nursing, but within the um, organizational healthcare structure across the nation, across a teaching hospital, 
that she is seeking the types of trainings and behaviors that change not only her work uh, individually as a nurse, but also create the leadership model. And I know many of you here as physicians, pharmacists, allied health professionals, the fact that you are here means you are embracing that already. You are already transformational in what you do, or you're seeking to become more transformational. The other thing I wanted to really say, I was so impressed uh, understanding the issues in Africa uh, from the work that I've done in Kenya. Uh, this is huge that Ghana celebrates elimination of trachoma. Chlamydia is a devastating disease on many levels. Uh, so the fact that you have eliminated trachoma uh, to, to, for a site-saving uh, focus, very uh, value. Um, COVAX, uh, the COVAX vaccine for COVID was Ghana was the first nation in the world to get the COVAX vaccine. That took strategic planning, uh, managerial, uh, engagement, and a willingness to be a leader. The other thing is, again, you've embraced the transformation program from World Health Organization um, that is working with senior managers within your health sector. And then the thing that is so impressive to Steve and I, because it's a frustration in our own nation, is this concept of achieving universal health coverage. Um, the, what we call single payer universal health care is a model many of us are committed to. It is very, very challenging to do within a capitalist uh, health care system that is actually functions as a business. Um, and the other thing is the role that a teaching hospital, uh, we are a large uh, teaching organization as well. And the fact that I'm able to actually teach medical students and physician faculty teach our um, graduate advanced practice uh, and nurses is really, really important within a culture. The fact that that happens within our teaching facility um, is so valuable and so important to model. Next. And Laura, we did have one question in the chat yep. um, from Abraham asked, however, how do we attain practice autonomy and interprofessional learning opportunities in the healthcare practice settings in certain developing countries where some of the professional disciplines seem to monopolize the system in terms of healthcare decisions? So I am going to speak to that directly because that is actually, having been a nurse for almost 50 years now, um, I have lived um, that transition, uh, transformational change in um, autonomy around nurses. And nurses for 16 years now have been voted as the uh, most trusted profession in the United States. The fact that we have achieved that mm -hmm. has come from um, a desire to improve leadership, um, a transformation uh, beliefs uh, around what improves healthcare and interprofessional relationships. And I'm going to speak a little bit more to that, but that has taken 50 years to get to the point of where I can say, yes, I teach medical still, school students and medical faculty teach um, nursing, you know, graduate students. So this collegiality, um, I'm going to speak to a little bit more about how we got there, because I think we have done well in some of that um, autonomy. We are not done, um, but there is no question. And I do not think it has lessened the voice or empowerment of other historically more powerful voices. I don't think it has lessened. It has actually improved all of our voices for better health care. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I hope did um, Abraham did that. I, I, I'm going to speak to it a little bit more and it comes to interprofessional education. Um, so this is so important because the next step after transformational uh, leadership is really transcendent leadership. And this is actually what makes solid worldwide change. And 
Steve and I are both dreamers. We're here because we believe to, as global healthcare citizens that we don't hoard um, our privileges um, of opportunities and education and resources that we have in a Western, uh, a well-funded Western nation. We want to take the challenges that we have experienced and say, let's be partners um, in global healthcare change. And that recalls on transcendent leadership and that recognizing that we are all connected. Every profession, titles aren't important. Our behaviors and how we treat others and how we view health outcomes is important. And this recognizes that we're not divided by false distinctions in race, gender, cultures, titles, training, and recognize that we all bring great value to this healthcare change. So these are some of the things that I I uh, think we have found to be very supportive in that, the very thing that Abraham, you have mentioned. We absolutely have found that team-based care has transformed healthcare outcomes. And team-based care includes all of the individuals who have some contact with a patient, whether it be acute care or ambulatory care. That includes physicians, nurses, pharmacists, uh, dietitians, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, discharge planners, uh, public health, home health nurses, uh, medical assistants, every level of contact with patients is a part of a team. And the, that also includes the patient who has a voice in preferences about how they want to see their health care. We also that we call that patient shared decision making statistically showed dramatic improvement of adoption of the types of change patients need to make to improve healthcare is to make them a part of the team and to create a plan that respects their values and desires. The other is cultural humility. And this isn't just about race or gender or titles is truly recognizing that our whole, the sum of our whole um, is, is greater than individuals, but that we don't have a whole unless we recognize the individual cultures and experiences that we each bring to that team. And we call that DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that happens in every level uh, in a country, uh, whether it can be tribal, whether it's by race or gender, all of this has a place uh, of addressing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that improves uh, outcome. The other is uh, to believe that healthcare is a right and not a privilege. And I think your adoption of a goal of universal healthcare really reflects that. But it's also, you could say that you have universal co coverage, but in this country, we are in an access process, and that is actually more so uh, in the African continent. There are not enough healthcare providers. And so if we say that only physicians can do certain types of care, or only nurses can do certain types of care, instead of recognizing that is what we call a scope of practice, what's the highest level of skill that individual professionals can be trained to. And this is where I think the role of the advanced uh, practice registered nurse has made dramatic change within the United States and other countries. And I actually have seen that there's a growing nurse practitioner and clinical uh, nurse specialist roles within Ghana. I think that is instrumental in making uh, change using a philosophy of team-based care. And it has absolutely changed healthcare, particularly for underserved and rural communities. Um, sadly, in many communities, especially in African nations, the nurse with the least training is the nurse that has the greatest contact in rural communities and is having to serve the most patients with the least education. That's an upside down concept. Nurses need high level of education to be in complex, uh, high risk environments with minimal support. And so access is only 
uh, drives healthcare. And then the focus on prevention and wellness starting in communities. And again, that is an area that nurses have a great strength if they're given the permission to have the contact and uh, providing the education in the community-based setting, working in a team with their uh, physician and allied health counterparts, pharmacists, uh, dietitians, all to focus on prevention and wellness and keep people out of the community. And the best way to start this collaborative uh, relationship is early in education of physicians, education of nurses, and all the allied health sciences. Um, at UC Davis, we focus on interprofessional education and simulation activities that include physicians, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and pharmacists, and registered dietitians. And we actually, Steve and I have actually developed that model in Kenya, uh, working with the University of Nairobi in a case-based focused uh, simulation that actually brought all of those interprofessional um, faculty uh, to learn how to teach in an interprofessional environment. And so when uh, the health professions learn together in the beginning, it is a natural transition to team-based care if you start in the beginning. And that is probably one of the biggest things, in my opinion, that has changed healthcare in the United States to a team-based care philosophy. It also statistically has improved patient safety and care outcomes. Uh, Steve, any comments further on this slide? Or we can go uh, to the next slide as well. No, I think you've summarized the uh, concluding, as we begin to conclude the really important points about transcendent uh, leadership. Uh, thank you. Next slide. So this transcendence, and I actually found this picture of six siblings from Philadelphia which is um, an underserved uh, inner city uh, population group that within one family, they have embraced this interprofessional culture. There are three physicians, including uh, the, the daughters and sons, a physician assistant and two nurse practitioners. And to me, that shows a true adoption start them young, train them together in the home to be interprofessional and allowing each to seek the level of education that brings them into the healthcare system uh, to be effective healthcare providers together. So this comes from a climate of trust of where we you know, talk the walk and walk the talk. We really talk about information sharing, transparency, and uh, disclosure, and we start that in our teaching hospital, in our teaching schools. We have meaningful uh, participation of all of our students, despite their titles. They train together on many levels, and they learn what each role has to bring to the table so they can build consens consensus on patient care decision-making. It empowers each of them to say, I know this, but I'll ask my colleague about this, which allows you to actually increase your level of independent practice. And then we also have a rule of safety in those teams, which means nobody attacks individuals, all differences of opinion, even around patient care, decision-making are heard, doesn't mean they're adopted, but they are heard in a respectful way and then can, and brought to consensus. And again, this redefinition of roles where we think of each other as, as associates on a team and being trained uh, in our training institutions in interprofessional environments. Next. So these are examples of transcendent leaders. They have changed the world. Um, they are reflective. They are value-centered. They're global in their perspective. And global is a way of thinking. 
It is not geography. They're facilitators of dialogue and deliberation. They recognize that service is more important than their self sunk to uh, uh, very tragic ends. And they're sometimes criticized for being dreamers as opposed to visionaries. And um, that's a hard criticism to take. But these three individuals stuck to their guns. And I think we easily could say they changed the world. Next. Steve, I'll let you take this. Absolutely. So here is our last few few points. And then um, uh, I will hand this back to uh, Marilyn for her, com uh, her concluding um, comments, if she has any, uh, and some of the organizational things that are already in the text. So transactional. <laughs> Simply put, give something to get something. Um, that's what uh, transaction is. You want this, I want that. Short-term, short-lived, sorts a problem of the here and now. Sometimes that's valuable. But actually, as all of us in our nursing roles and our organizational roles, want longer term solutions, want larger impact on for nursing, on healthcare, and to improve uh, organizations as well, we need to be transformational, going beyond self-interest for the good of the whole, be it your staff, be it your managers, be it your patients, your hospital, your organization. And the transcendental, of course, is service above self. And uh, I think many of us... Um, realize that the we don't think about the hours that we work as being on the clock. We do what we need to do. It's the service that we do for our patients that makes this all worthwhile. And um, as the last comment um, is, to rule or govern is easy. To lead, as I, I both um, Laura and I have uh, suggested throughout, is difficult. But to lead well takes support education, working with other groups, getting institutional approval and support. However, it's in our, our view that to bring about lasting, informed change, transformational ways are the ones of the future. Some are here already. There's a long way to go. And certainly, Laura and I hope that we've at least opened the window, perhaps, uh, to understanding how important transformational leadership is to nursing wherever you are in the world uh, and how this approach has so many benefits for patients your units your hospital and your communities that uh, we would encourage um, uh, further thought about this as a way forward um uh, thank Next. you thank you very much yes there will be one more slide i think yeah, actually one. And then uh, next there's a resource list. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. Um, this is one of our simulation spaces. It replicates uh, home-based care. Um, and I'm actually teaching home-based uh, tomb care uh, uh, with our graduate uh, nurse practitioner, uh, actually as part of our nurse uh, residence, uh, residency program after they're nationally board certified. Um, the next slide uh, is the last one that will be there within this slide panel, which is resources um, that um, I used throughout uh, Steve and I developing this, this PowerPoint. And uh, we will make the uh, PowerPoint available to you. And uh, someone had made a request for a recording. I don't know if this can be put on our YouTube channel, whether that would be something that we could do, but we'll explore the mechanisms for having the recording available. Yeah. Um, Marilyn. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, please, if you have any questions, you can put it in the um, chat box. I would like to say that we are privileged to have our Director of Nursing Services in our midst in person of Georgina Ifwasam. We have our consultants, Dr. C um, Collins Kokuro. We have all our directors, um, majority of our directors here at Confanoche, and with all our um, our pharmacists and head of pharmacy and everyone present, our doctors and nurses and pharmacists present here, thank you all. Um, if you have any questions, please put in the chat box. 
would ask our director of nursing services if she has a word. She heads Confanochi Teaching Hospital, all the nurses. So if anytime she had a word, she could, I mean, give a word. But if you have any questions, it's question time. If you have any questions, please, you can put it in the chat box. Thank and, you. And Abraham. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. I'm happy to talk. Uh, Abraham, you, you ask some very difficult questions, but I, I hope to give you um, uh, some answer, answers to this. Uh, and you're absolutely right. This is very difficult. Uh, I'll be honest with you that we, we too have challenges um, with disciplines on who start different times of the year, who are sometimes in practice while, while nursing, for example, is in the classroom. Uh, but you know, one of the ways we have uh, overcome these challenges in this interprofessional education is to plan for opportunities. Um, so we get together the teaching teams of both medicine in our case and nursing to find out opportunities where we can share uh, chances to be in the same room together. Although we're, at, we're a bit big now to be able to go into one room. But I think the issue, as with transformation leadership, one has to actively plan for this to happen. People must want it to happen, see value from it, not just from the from the teachers, but also from the students. Um, but this is what we have, have to work on. And in our case, we just got the key uh, people uh, together to work out times to do this. But it took time and it required us to look forward planning. Um, and, and Marilyn, I know we're close to time, but I'm, I'm impressed that you have brought so many people together. You're already doing interprofessional learning, interprofessional education. Um, outstanding. And, and I, I will stop at this point in case uh, your your uh, senior leadership would like to, um, to speak. Uh, I'd very much like to hear what they have to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so I, much. I want to make a quick, quick, quick comment too about the interprofessional education. It is very hard with mixed and different schedules, and it was especially hard when we used to try it, to do it physically. We now do some of those uh, simulation activities by Zoom, and we have developed some really effective case-based uh, simulations and a method of doing our interprofessional education. Uh, across our systems um, through Zoom. And so that has been probably one of the biggest advances. Um, but there is no question it's difficult. There's a deep commitment because we know it makes a difference. Okay, good evening to everyone. Good evening. This is uh, uh, Jenaifo Sam, Director of Nesting from Fanochi Teaching Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, um, on behalf of the management, and staff of the hospital, I want to say a big thank you to the team from Maryland. And uh, we also thank the team from Confanochi, being led by Marilyn for this great move. Um, I think um, we would like to uh, say that this collaboration is good and it's going to help us, not only even for the nurses and midwives, the collaboration should continue and I know that um, we, we have a lot to share from Africa and the US. So I'm happy. I know we've learned a lot and it's going to help us to improve on our leadership. Wherever, as a nurse or midwife, you find yourself, you are a leader there. So I know this collaboration is going to help us. So I pray it continues and uh, great delivery this evening. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Director of Nursing Services. Thank you so much. Please, if you have any questions, you can still put it in the chat box. I think there are a few questions in the chat box. Well, and people, if they want, they can um, unmute and just speak if they'd like. Yeah, you can raise your hand. Uh, sorry. Okay, so there's one question in chat. Let me see. Okay. In developing countries, okay, this is from Abigail Destiny Owusu Edu. 
in developing countries, what practitioners hate is <sighs> cohesion with their decision for from nurses. What do we do in such cases? If I didn't understand anything at all, I understand silos. Thank you. Thanks, Laura and Steve. We are motivated from the presentation that we can take up leadership roles in all the systems. So the question is, um, in the developing countries, what practitioners hate? In, okay, so what do we do in such cases? Laura, any of you would like to take that? So to do in what kind of case? To increase um, nursing voice or roles? I think so, that... yeah. So I I have to tell you, my, I have a very particular agenda in promoting the advanced practice nurse practitioner role around the world, and the reason why is that nurse midwives are already that role around the world. They already are independent practitioners. They are advanced practice nurses, and so I. Um, think it is reasonable to move the next step, which I'm a family nurse practitioner, um, meaning that I work in primary care across the lifespan. Um, the The training is graduate training. Training it's essentially, you know, the primary care ambulatory component of of medical school. I never ever represent myself as a physician but I absolutely have content expertise in many of the types of things only physicians would do before around chronic disease management, preventive health care, uh, routine acute care, community-based conditions, and even some minor surgeries. And the clinical officer role is very well established. For example, in Kenya, I'm very, those are my colleagues when I go to Kenya, um, they very much are a non-physician you know, advanced practice role. And I think the equivalent uh, is reasonably developed from nursing around the world based on nurse midwifery. And uh, doesn't mean you have to have independent practice. It means that you have team-based practice that expands access to care. And I will share with you, many patients have a preference because they're intimidated sometimes by the physician role. They are not intimidated by the nursing role. I think Hope has a question. So Hope, you can unmute. All right, I think, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay. All right, thank you so much. I, I'm really impressed with the level of knowledge you just imparted on us. This is high level knowledge. And it's very good. And I like the way you had total command of your slide and you knew what you were going to say at each point in time. That's very nice. I'm, I'm highly impressed. And I've really learned a lot. Um, I just want to situate our thing in the Ghanaian contest. And uh, um, I, during my uh, info research, I looked at leadership and it's my area of interest in a way. So I, 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 I saw something, I was looking at leadership and its effect on productivity, and I use subordinate characteristics as a, a mod, moderate, moderator, use it as a moderating effect. And I, surprisingly, what came out of it was that using the uh, houses part goal leadership theory, where you have the directive, uh, participative leadership and all that, it's rather it showed that the end directive mm -hmm. that uh, it rather surprised me that directive leadership was the one that was giving us more productivity in our context. And then when I sat down after the work and I wanted to look at the results, I realized that yes, the characteristics were proving more like a chunk of the Ghanaian nurses were not having the higher level of expertise and level of training. So if you want to equate this to trans. Uh, transformational, it means that if we want to have uh, people understand what leadership is and then how to gel with the leaders, it means that we have to put concrete measures in place to upgrade our people, bring them up, up, up a bit so that they can really understand what we, I think we, we as a nursing fraternity is all about. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. I put in the clapping hands. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Hope. I think that um, we have to raise the knowledge 
and skill levels throughout our organization. Um, and I think what you have summarized and congratulations on getting some, some research done there, um, uh, that that's a really important finding um, that we must continue learning always. Um, but thank you for that. And, and I know we're getting a little short on, on time, I think. So um, uh, do we have any other questions or Marilyn, uh, can I hand over to you to uh, any concluding um Issues. I saw some interesting thing about certificates. So, so there's something you are you are planning. I think. Yes, please. So, um, we would like everyone to send your full names to the email that has been sent over there, because it's, we had over 400 people registering, and we have we've seen 167 present. So, we just want to present it to only those who, I mean, only those who were present. And to the slides, we will send it to only those who were present as well as the recording. So that's why we are still taking, we are still collating the attendance. So please try and send your full name as you want it and the details as it's been written. Thank you very much. I think there's a hand raised. Asha Opon, um, you, could, you could talk. You could please speak. Thank you very much. Um, the little thing I want to say is that I want to thank the presenters for a very fantastic information. And then another thing that I will say is that in as much as we are the, a nursing is not uh, autonomous in its own, but we work with interdiscipline, any knowledge you are, that we get and we need to channel to people, it should be in a way for the person to also understand. We can use, we sometimes in Africa here, we, we mix, someone who is assertive with someone who wants to, uh, let's say the person is uh, uh, disrespectful. But in, in, at any point, if you are a leader and you want to communicate something to someone, you need to have um, a very good way of approaching. Then the person will also understand where you are coming from. But if not, all this knowledge that we've gathered and then we want to push to become or sell out certain things in order to bring change as a leader. We need to understand where the people are coming from and where we want to get to. If we are able to do that in a very calm and then assertive way in pushing through, I think we will be able to excel. So thank you very much. This is what I have to say. Oh, uh, thank you. And that really was a very good comment. And I think some of the things Laura and I were talking about was the important about forward planning. I mean, we, we call it sort of formally strategic planning, but that is sometimes it's really helpful to simply write down and agree what's important, what's important now, what's important in the future, the things, because you can't do everything. We all, we all know as nurses and midwives, if there are some midwives and, and pharmacists, and we'd love, love to do everything at the same time. But the fact is we do have to prioritize. And sometimes we have to take time to agree what those are plan for them and your your point is absolutely well taken communicate those findings to others well, through whatever channels work uh, it may be electronically it may be there are meetings in which uh, you're able to create opportunities to have people comment on what's important whether that's across shifts or somehow we often do a thing called a town hall Every so often, we, we get as many uh, folks together on a Zoom and say, this is where we are. These are the things that are important. This is how much progress we have made on these things. Some things, I'm sure you will say, we've actually solved or fixed. That's, that's always good. But we all know there are many things that would take a lot longer to do that. So I think there's some very creative ways of using technology uh, to communicate uh, success. So thank you for that point. Uh, very well taken, very timely. I would say that what's important in those town halls is if the top level leaders do not come and participate, it disrespects the whole community. And so it really takes a buy-in from the top leadership to demonstrate that they're willing to give the time to hear the voices and, and hear the recommendations for solutions. The other thing I want to say is there's a interprofessional, um, op uh, excuse me, a nursing opportunity in Sigma Theta Tau International that has a virtual chapter specifically largely serves um, Africa 
um, although Ghana does not have a chapter, I strongly recommend for nursing in particular, they give very excellent uh, transformational uh, leadership training seminars that you can enroll in for free. Um, and, and then I think probably our, our last comment, because uh, believe it or not, I have I have more Zoom meetings today. I um, do too. Is that, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we will we will absolutely be sharing um, those uh, slides um, uh, with you. Uh, we do have a recording made. We're working out how we how soon we can get that to you and in what way. Uh, but again, we'll let Marilyn know. Sorry to put too much work on you, but you can be our single point of contact for this. Um, and I was just just amazed um, that the that the number of participants. I want to thank you very much that you stayed the course. Uh, sometimes in the US we get uh, people um, dropping off and and not uh, continuing. Uh, I think the numbers of 140, 150, 160 plus have been really outstanding, and it just shows the interest uh, that folks have in this topic. We all know there's work to do, and if in any small way uh, we've been able to. Um, Point you to resources. Laura put together a, a resource list. Or if there are any other questions, we can try and take those uh, through um, emails in, in the future. Um, uh, but thank you. Marilyn. Thank you very much again, Steve. Thank you so much. Please kindly send your details to the email that you see here. Um, I would like our Director of Nursing Services to give the final closing. And um, before that, I would want to thank all clinicians who were participating, all physicians, all categories of professionals who were present here. Um, looking forward, we'll be doing more subsequent with the permission of the management of Confuanoche. We'll still be doing more collaborative things with Steve and Laura in the future and other people they'll be connecting us to. So thank you so much, Steve. I would end here and let our Director of Nursing Services speak. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Marilyn, for uh, leading the session. I also want to thank Steve and um, Laura. Steve and Laura. Um, Laura, okay, yeah, for, for the great delivery. We are so happy. We've learned a lot. And I think it's not only Ghana. I don't know so far which other country have joined the session. And I want to thank all of you for your continued stay and participation. I also monitored the participants and it has ranged from 140 to 160. So I think our next session will even get more than. And for the registration, definitely to be higher than the attendance, but I'm happy at least we had uh, um, more than we expect. Um, Steve, we are happy, as I said earlier, let's continue the collaboration. And I think we, we, we have more in common than what we are seeing now. Thank you so much. The doctors and the other staff who joined to, especially the nurses and midwife, we know we've learned a lot. We are going to put, uh, put it into practice, especially wherever we are in our directorates and our units. On the whole, I think it has been a success. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you much, Dr. Kokoro. Thank you so much, Dr. Lambert, um, Dr. Divine, everybody present here. I can't mention every name, but I know internal medicine and every other department present. Nigeria is here and all other people here. Doc Dr. Beduado and Professor Beduado, who is present from Okodia Road. We've seen you all. Thank you from KNUSD. Thank you for being present. Sorry, Steve, you can Thank speak. you very much. Oh, no, I was going to say thank you very much. At this point, uh, we wish you well. Uh, and obviously, Marilyn, we, we can help you further in your own personal endeavours uh, uh, through following up with the, the Mandela um, Award. Do let us know. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. It's Bye. been a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.